Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, I'm going to start with a land acknowledgement. We want to acknowledge that the Brockton Writers Series organizes our work on the land of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, Huron-Wendat, and Mississaugas of the New Credit. And we uh, acknowledge the ways that colonization, genocide, and racism have impacted Indigenous peoples, and that settlers have a responsibility to make space for Indigenous voices at events like this. For many of us, this includes, uh, we need to recognize how our ancestors as settlers have contributed to colonial uh, legacies with both silences and actions. It also means we need, expect you to write to your elected officials and ask them to report back on progress for recommendations in the TRC and uh, land back and missing and murdered indigenous women and take all of these issues really seriously. Um, I usually kind of go off, but I don't want to do that tonight. <laughs> um, uh, we also acknowledge that Black Lives Matter, and we continue to center and feature Black and Indigenous voices, other people of color, and other represented groups like disabled people and to us LGBTQIA people, and all of this is in our mandate. Um, thank you very much for being here with us tonight at Glad Day Bookshop, and those joining us online on our YouTube channel, please like and subscribe. <laughs> Today's lineup will include a guest speaker with a brief Q&A and then our four readers followed by a group Q&A for them as well. If you're watching live online, please type your questions into the YouTube chat as they occur to you. We will collect them to ask during the Q&A. And now I'd like to invite up my co-host, Ellen. 
All right, hi everyone. So if you haven't been here before, Brockton Writers Series was founded in November 2009, which means that we've been, in, we've been active in the Toronto literary scene for over a decade, which is very cool. Our nimble Brockton volunteers are Jen Albert, Nancy K. Clark, Dorian Emerton, who just spoke, Sonia Guitar, Faye Dong, and I am Elen Crowley. If you're interested in joining our awesome team of volunteers, we're looking right now for co-host um, and also co-curator, uh, which would be awesome. So if you're interested or in any other role, please come speak to us at the end of the night. We would also like to acknowledge with deep thanks the continued support of the Ontario Arts Council who make this series possible. And finally, our sincere thanks to all of you, our audience who's here tonight, and also those of you who are tuning in online. We see you and we're really glad that you're here. Now we are going to go on to our guest speaker. So tonight we have Jennifer Alicia, who is a queer Mi'kmaq settler, German, Irish, and Scottish, and multidisciplinary artist originally from Alema Stugwek, Uktahungut. Her work was featured in CBC Arts Now Magazine and Cantheus Magazine. Jennifer Alicia recently co-edited The Condor and the Eagle Meat, which is an Indigenous poetry anthology. Everyone, please welcome Jennifer Alicia. Hi, everyone. I think I would know how to use a microphone by now. Um, but this one has pretty things on it and I'm scared to touch it. Uh, is it okay, this is okay, this is okay. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here this evening. I know you're not just here to see me, there are readers, you know, um, you probably come here quite often, um, but thank you so much for coming tonight and thank you to the organizers for um, inviting me to be here. Um, I'm going to be sharing some performance tips for you all uh, this evening as a spoken word artist, as a performer. Um, I think there's some things that uh, maybe I could lend to you as readers um, and those, you know, skills could be transferable um, between, you know, both groups. Uh, I will start off by saying I'm also not an expert in this whatsoever. I'm just going to share my journey. Um, and my story. And then, you know, if there's some things that you can take from it, that's great. Uh, hopefully there's at least one thing that you can take home with you this evening uh, that I share. Um, and then you can leave the rest. That's totally okay. If there's things that I say that you're like, mm, that doesn't really sit right with me, totally fine, won't be offended. It's all good. Um, I will also say that uh, I still get nervous and it's okay to be nervous. I have been performing since I was like three years old. I'm an 80s baby. I'm from the time where like, you know, you put on the new kids in the block cassette tape, you know, a family member sets up a camcorder and then you're like dancing for hours and they're just recording you. That was me. Uh, so I've been performing, you know, since I was three years old. Um, and I've been performing spoken words since I was 19. I'm 36 now, so, you know, a little bit of time. Uh, but I still get nervous every single time. It doesn't matter if I'm in front of, you know, 20 people at Glad Day Bookshop or if I'm front, in front of hundreds of people at Nathan Phillips Square. I still get nervous. Um, and someone told me that it's because you care that you get nervous, but I also have anxiety. So I feel like it's like... <laughs> You know, I'm like, I don't know how much it is, like caring or my anxiety, but I feel like there's like a good mix between the two. Uh, I also heard that Beyonce said at a recent concert here in Toronto that she still gets nervous. And if she doesn't get nervous for a show, then there's something wrong. So even the queen gets nervous. Uh, so I just, all of that is to say that nerves are totally okay. And people who have been doing this for a long time still get nervous. And it's okay. Um, all right, so we're gonna go through a whole journey. Um, I'm gonna share, like I said, my experience um, and how I prepare for performing. Um, before the actual performance or reading in this case, there's a whole lot of work that goes into it. Um, one of the things I'll say is know and love your work. And you're probably like, 
I write my work, like I write these words, of course I know my words and of course I love them. But what I, what I mean by saying that is knowing and loving your work to the point where you embody it. Um, those words are like in your muscles, in your bones, in your joints, in your blood. You know, there's no mistaking them, you know, that those words, your words are within you. Um, and there's some tips I'm gonna share to, you know, help you with the embodiment of, of your words. Um, the baby that you're hearing is mine. So <laughs> if you're like, that baby needs to shut up, I'm like, no, you need to. No, no. I'm a mama bear. <laughs> That's my baby. Uh, it's okay if he makes noise. It's also okay if you make noise too. It's totally fine. Um, What's his name? His name's Odin. And I'm not going to go too far into it, but both of his parents are poets. <laughs> and so an ode is a poem that honors like a person, place, thing, idea. So Odin is our little ode to the world, a little, a little poem to the, you know, poetic poetry, it's great. Okay, know and love your work. Um, and then, so before obviously you know and love your work, your excerpt that you're gonna read in front of the group, uh, obviously you should pick a, a section or a, an excerpt that you think is going to be relevant to the audience. Um, you know, relevant to the space that you're in, relevant to the theme. Uh, so if I'm going to perform at an Indigenous Day event, I'm going to probably choose some poems or some pieces that have to do with being Indigenous. Uh, I would argue that all of my poetry is Indigenous because I'm an Indigenous person, but you, know, whatever. but you know, choose an excerpt that you feel that the audience might resonate with and then practice, practice, practice. Um, for me, what I do, I like to memorize my poetry. That is not a requirement. And you know, you, that's, it's okay. It's also very ableist, but I like to memorize. And so what helps me with like the embodiment and memorization is I will actually record myself saying my poem. So record yourself saying the excerpt that you choose. Uh, this is pretty simple to do. I think most of us, you know, have cell phones or laptops with free voice recorder apps. Record yourself and then listen to it over and over and over again. I know it sounds boring, but like you're in the shower, you're listening to yourself, you know, say that excerpt. You're cleaning your house, you're take, doing a run, you know, working out, going on the TTC, whatever you're doing, you can just listen to it. Going to sleep, that's a good one. Um, going to sleep and listening to it, listening to it on repeat, you know, um, that will help with the embodiment of those words. And then when you feel comfortable enough with that piece, you can start to play around with it. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, thinking about the emphasis, thinking about the pauses, thinking about the tone, uh, how do you want to say what you want to say? Uh, what is it that you want to convey to the audience? What is the important? What are the important words? What are the important lines? Um, and so you just play around with it, uh, you, you know. And I like to do this in front of people sometimes. Like if you're like that's scary, choose people that you love, that love you, that you feel comfortable around. Maybe it's you know your friends or family. Um, maybe it's like an informal writing group. Um, during COVID, I was part of a, a casual writing group that met every week and we would just like share new poems or like, you know, perform new po poems and ask feedback from each other. Um, so, you know, do that in front of people that will be gentle to you um, because it is scary. Um, and also what I do because I'm this person is once you find like uh, the rhythm, the pauses, the emphasis that feels good to you, you can actually like actually write it in to your excerpt. So you could like word, 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 write in, pause. I do that. If I'm going to change my tone, sometimes I'll put like a little up arrow next to the word like, you're gonna say it like this uh, to remind myself, you know, this is what feels good. Uh, and sometimes I black out when I'm on the mic. So I'm like, okay, if I have it written down, um, that is what's gonna help me. So for instance, you know, if I read this, this is just a few lines from a poem. 
The article reads, scientific research studies have proven smudging with sage can cure airborne bacteria populations by 94%. That's pretty, you know, that's all right. Like maybe the words hate you, maybe they didn't. Um, but how I like to read it at is, the article reads, Scientific research studies have proven that smudging with sage can clear airborne bacteria populations by 94%. That sounds, you know, drastically different from the first one. And what helped me get to that comfortability uh, is the practicing, the playing around with the words, the feedback from folks. Um, so hopefully that's something you'll be able to to practice or to figure out. And then also like, like I said, literally write in pause, literally write in emphasis, literally write in like change the tone um, if that's what uh, works for you. And also what I love to do uh, as a performer is record myself on Zoom, like for myself, that's something that's very easy to do. You enter the Zoom room, I'm sure like a lot of folks have have been on Zoom because of the pandemic and blah, blah, blah. But Zoom, you can go in the Zoom room by yourself. You can record yourself. And so sometimes what I'll do is actually record myself on Zoom, reading my piece, um, you know, reading your excerpt and just actually you like recording yourself. I know it's scary. Like, I don't even like watching myself. Like, on, when people are like, oh, you have this video on YouTube. I'm like, Ew, please don't tell me that. I don't, I love performing, but I don't like watching myself. Uh, so I know it's scary. It's very scary. It's, you know, you're looking at yourself. It's, we analyze ourselves. You know, we think things, we criticize ourselves, blah, blah, blah. But this is just for you. It doesn't have to go anywhere. It's not going on YouTube. It's just for you. Um, and so record yourself on Zoom. See what your face is doing. You know, what does your face look like when you're saying these words? Like when you're saying these lines? Is it actually conveying what you want to convey with the audience? Um, sometimes, well, no, not sometimes. All the time I have like resting bitch face. So like people are like, wow, they really hate me. And I'm like, no, it's just my face. So like, you know, practice on Zoom, see what your face is doing um, and see if that's, you know, how you want to present yourself to the audience. Um, that's something that I really love to do and I do it quite often. Um, and that is actually, you know, a privilege of living in this day and age where we have, you know, Zoom and uh, voice recorder apps. Um, okay, so that is like the preparation to get you to that moment of the reading or of the performance. Uh, so you know and love your work, you practice, 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 you might have, you know, shared in front of some folks, you might have just recorded yourself on Zoom. Okay, you're ready, you're like prepared for the moment. The moment's here, you're at the reading, and now it's like time to do your thing. I will walk you through how I like to prepare. Uh, I like to go into a space where I'm performing and kind of hide in the corner in the back. Um, <laughs> because what usually happens um, is folks will come up to you and ask you, how are you feeling? How do you feel about your reading? Are you excited? Are you nervous? And I find all of those questions make me even more nervous. I'm like, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to do this. Like, I want to like prepare myself for this moment. This is my moment and I need to prepare and I don't want people like interfering with that. And so I'll usually find a quiet space. Uh, maybe I'll, you know, practice my poem in my head. Maybe I'll listen to some Beyonce. I don't know. I'm just going to take that time to myself in the back, in the quiet, and just prepare myself for the moment um, so that I'm not, you know, distracted by folks. And so they call my name. Please welcome Jennifer Alicia to the stage. And then I exit from my moment, get on the mic, um, and do my thing. And because I've embodied my words, it's going to be, you know, I'm feeling confident now. I'm like, okay, I've meditated. I've embodied my words. I feel like I got this. But during performances, so many things could happen. Uh, so many mishaps could happen. The power could go out. A drink could spill. Like, 
you know, somebody could trip. We don't, we don't want that to happen, but it's like, things happen. We're, you know, we're out in the wild, like things happen all the time. <laughs> and so just roll with it is what I'm going to say. Just try to like be present and roll with, with whatever that's happening. You can actually acknowledge things like, you know, somebody spills a drink and be like, oh no, you know, I, I was so powerful. I knocked over that drink. I don't know. Make some stuff up. I don't just, you know, just roll with it. It's okay. It's okay to acknowledge what's happening. Um, it, you know, makes it a little less awkward um, and lean into yourself, whatever your personality is. Uh, I'm very awkward and I used to be very self-conscious about being awkward, um, which would make me like even more awkward, but I've learned to just lean into it. I'm like, okay, I'm awkward. Like, it's okay. Like, that's my personality. That's who I am. I'm going to lean into it and that's going to be what it is. So maybe during these mishaps, I say something awkward. It's okay because that's who I am. Uh, also during performances you know, you can get distracted very easily. Um, for example, I'm, I am not good at this. I try not to get distracted, but I will say I am not good at this at all. I had a performance recently um, for Brampton Pride in their Garden Square, which is like their equivalent of Dundas Square. It's not as big, it's, it's a lot smaller, <laughs> intimate. Um, but you know, you're outside in the public, in a square, downtown Brampton. There's some people who are sitting and listening to you because like, you know, you, they're looking at you. So you're like, okay, I got some people. But then there's people having conversations over here that you can kind of hear for some reason. And then I saw my mom take my baby for my friend. And then my baby was like flailing his arms. I heard him crying. I was like, oh my God, like I'm on this stage and there's all of these different things happening. How do I keep going? I kept going because I embodied my words. <laughs> I had those words stuck in my body. I don't even know how it happened, but they just kept rolling out of my mouth. And because I've embodied those words and practiced so much, it kind of, I'm not saying it was easy at all, it just became a little easier to just keep going because I was comfortable, I was familiar with what I was saying. If I missed a line or missed a word, I could kind of make it up because I'm like, I feel like I know what I'm talking about. So I could kind of like, <laughs> you know, continue like, oh, I missed this line, it's okay. Um, and it's also okay if you miss a line or you miss a word. Most times the audience don't even notice. Like you're gonna go, after you're reading your performance, you're gonna criticize yourself and say, oh man, I didn't say this right or I forgot this thing. The audience doesn't know, it's okay. Unless they're reading along with you in your book and then they might know, but <laughs> that's okay, it's okay. Most of the times the audience don't even notice those things. Um, and so I got really distracted from my mom and the baby and the first people talking and all these things happening. But I just kept it rolling because those words were in my body. Um, so try not to get distracted. I know it's easier to say it than to do it. Um, you know, somebody might get up in the middle of your reading and leave. And you're like, oh shit, what does that mean? Like, why did they leave my reading? Like, did I offend them? Or like, maybe they just needed to leave. Um, so try not to get in your head. Try not to get distracted. Um, like I said, it's easier said than done. Um, and just, you know, do your best. Um, so practice, practice, practice. You've performed. You've done your reading. It's gone great because you've embodied your words. Um, you didn't get distracted, you know, you rolled with the punches, you just, you know, you leaned into your awkwardness or whatever it is that's, you know, part of your personality. Um, and now you're done. So now you're done your reading. What do you do? For me, again, I like to go hide in the back. Because after the reading, people are going to come up to you and they're going to have questions. Some people might even have feedback. Like, mm, yeah. Yeah, like, oh, you said this one thing, but like, I think it would sound better if you said it like this. No, 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 no. That is a big no, no. Even Odin agrees. He's like, no, 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 no
no. So I like to go find my corner, find my quiet space and just like decompress because a lot of adrenaline's happening too. Um, so like your heart's pumping, you're like, oh my God, I just did this thing. I feel so great. Or, you know, I feel something. Um, go and decompress, like breathe, you know, ground yourself, um, do whatever you need to do to like come back to the present time. Um, and if people come up to you and they're like, I want to give you feedback on this thing, it's okay to say no. I've said no in not so nice ways, many times, many, many times. Um, sometimes I do welcome it depending on the person, you know, if it's like a spoken word poet that I recognize has been doing this for some time, like, okay, maybe, maybe I should get some advice from them, but it's okay to say no. Um, so after your performance, decompress, uh, do whatever you do need to do to make yourself feel good. Um, and that's basically the gist of it. That's how I like to prepare um, for my performances. That's, yeah, I know performing is not, you know, performing spoken word poetry is not exactly the same as reading um, at a media series. But hopefully um, there's some things that I'm sharing or shared that, you know, you could use in your life. If not, that's totally okay. Um, I don't know how long I've been talking because I've kind of just been rambling. So is this thing on? Is yeah. this thing on? Yes. Okay, great. Um, that you're, you're pretty much right on time. Okay, okay. good. You're good. Yeah. Uh, so do we have any questions? Questions. Questions. Yes. Ah. Uh, uh, it's an obstacle course. <laughs> Don't knock over the expensive thing right now. <laughs> Do you have any strategies for, say, for example, slip up in the line? Uh, do you have any strategies in regards to that? Um, I just keep it rolling. Like, if I miss a line, which actually happens quite often, I'll just, because I know the poem or the piece so well, I'll just continue with the next line. Sometimes I've actually made up a whole stanza. <laughs> just like, and then I get off the stage and I'm like, that is not what I was supposed to say. But because I knew my work and loved it so much, I kind of just made up some stuff. And I was like, okay, the audience doesn't know, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Wait, um, what's your take on banter? So if you do you know, like a 20 minute set with a bunch of poems, some poets or, or writers like to have a little bit of chatting in between. Mm -hmm. Poems, other poets like to go through the poems and leave any kind of banter for like the beginning or the mm -hmm. end. So what's your take on Banter. I am terrible at banter. Uh, I'm a very awkward person, as I just mentioned. So I'll actually write my banter. Like it'll look like I'm not, I didn't write any, I didn't write this, what I'm saying right now. You know, obviously, Dave was not planted, um, but like I'll actually write my banter sometimes, like because I get so awkward and I get so nervous that sometimes I actually kind of black out when I'm on the mic, and like I might have a panic attack, like things might happen that I don't want to happen. So I will actually write the banter, like not word for word, but I'll practice. Like here's how I want to introduce myself. Okay, I'm gonna say this poem. So here's how I'm gonna introduce this poem. Like I prepare that so that I'm not like just getting up and free talking. Like, good for you know people can do that and that's great, but I like to prepare my banter. Any final questions? Uh oh 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 yes. Yeah. Uh, do you have like an Instagram account or something where we can follow you and your incredible career? <laughs> I did not plant Charlie. <laughs> Great uh, question. I, yeah, I'm on Instagram. I just, I don't post. I, yeah, okay. I'm on Instagram, East Coast Jam, if you're interested. Um, and also a book that I co-edited, The Eagle and the Condor Meet. It, it's actually available uh, over there on the table, if you're interested in checking out 16 Amazing Indigenous Poets, there's also a QR code in there that you can scan and then go to actual YouTube performances of some of the work as well. So.
Um, my question is about like how long it took for you to start to develop these techniques to help you kind of deal with being on stage or performing. Um, or is it still a gradual process? Yeah, I would say it's a gradual process. I learned from a lot of folks as well. Um, like the recording myself and listening to it on repeat was something that another poet um, shared with me. So I kind of like the same thing, I kind of pick up things, like leave things and then pick up things that I think are gonna be useful that other folks have shared. Um, so it's kind of just a ongoing learning process, just, you know, collecting all the things that will help me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Loading up my script again. Okay. So now that we are reaching the world with our very own Brockton Writers Series YouTube channel, which I hope lots of people are watching us on right now, um, we would be very helped out if you would like and subscribe. Uh, if you're online right now, please hit those buttons. If you're in the room right now, please go home or on your break, pull out your phone, hit those buttons. It really helps us uh, promote this wonderful event and all of the wonderful readers that we, uh, that we feature and that we want to promote for amazing Canadian literature. Um, we would also like your money. Uh, we are generously funded by the Ontario Arts Council. Thanks very much to them. Um, but if you give us donations, all of that goes to help support our uh, amazing writers. So we will be passing around a picture that you can put your cash in. Um, or if you are a cashless person or on YouTube, you can go to paypal.me slash writers if you can spare a few dollars for our brilliant writers and interpreters. And now for the readers. Um, again, for those of you watching live at home, please home questions into the chat as they occur. We'll collect them for the Q&A at the end uh, for all four writers. First up, we have Hannah and Michael. She, her. <laughs> um, we're very excited because Hannah is a former volunteer with Brockton, and so we, we love her lots. Um, resides in Toronto, living her life one day at a time, with a bit of courage, a bit of wonder at what could be, and tongue-tied on what currently is, she offers snapshots of thoughts recorded and words spoken. I'm having a trouble. Good evening, everyone. My name is Hannah Andrew Michael, and I'm a former volunteer with Brockton Writer Series, and that's what's given me the opportunity to stand before you today. The last 10 years has been a time of intense reflection, both inside of myself and outside. The ideas and thoughts I share with you today are snapshots of me at different moments. The image behind me is a self-portrait from a couple of years ago that also captured me in a moment of time. My life and death first met in passing when I first drew breath and invited the space of impermanence to live inside me. Ever the eternal motivator, the hourglass of time is the reason I share my thoughts with you now. I'd like to get a word in before they meet again. Unfounded, the restless ones, looking for satisfaction, never coming for too long, out of focus, shaky, blurred, and woozy. I have not found and haven't been found, but I am not lost, I am unfound. Constitution. Perspectives abound, but truths lay bare, fears and hopes, heart wide open to see. Tick talk, an honest conversation between you and me. me. Mm. 
me. You. Has failed to materialize. Hanging by a thread, brought to you by the onion peel suspended by a spider's thread in the kitchen closet. No better an apt description of melancholy than constant suspension. The urge. I walked into the kitchen with the breeze, feeling light as a feather, fully embodying the 80s woman. She's gone to Capri and she's never coming back. Then I felt it the full weight of lead crystal glass in hand. Had it been this glaringly heavy when I picked it up? With every step, I felt a paralyzing heaviness spreading through my hands and into my arm. I could see the distance between me and the kitchen counter was a mere couple of feet, but I began to wonder if we both make it intact to our destination point. A slight, quick panic moment later, I looked down at my hand and felt the relief of sweet release. I watched the glass fall, first slowly and muted, then loudly when it met the unrelenting indifference of the stone tile floor. Mounds of crystal dust glittered and littered before me, transforming the place I was standing into an island oasis surrounded by the consequences of my actions, an old familiar place. So enthralled was I by this nostalgic vision that I hadn't noticed that I had almost reached the counter. The weight of suspension snapped me back into place. And even though the glass was empty, I walked with so much care as if we were almost overflowing and would topple with the slightest imbalance. Slowly, calmly, gently, I placed the glass on the counter. I looked down and felt a longing for what could have been and regret at what wasn't. Oddly enough, a week later, <laughs> by accident, that same glass broke. <laughs> so the universe found a way to let the urge express itself. <laughs> And just like life, I require a lot of intervention. <laughs> um, love locked. Turn to the right until you feel the beat of my heart when it hears your voice. Reverse a full rotation left to the sound of it breaking when you were stopped. Dial a little to the right until you hear it flutter at the hope of seeing you again. Currency exchange. Money is the cheapest and disappointing of currencies. It ensnares addicts and hoarders, and in the pursuit of more, they kill all that holds true value. Time is a shifting and misunderstood currency and the one most wasted. Love is the most transformative currency, best freely exchanged and highly susceptible to fraud. This is called a Thesis Without Borders, and it's a fancy way of saying I haven't written the supporting cast of verbiage <laughs> to accompany them. The more, privilege we, the more privilege we have, the more our humanity suffers. The standards we've set are a tripping hazard. We're dying in the reality of our disbelief. And the one I wanna write the most, life can either lose itself in the cracks or be found in them. And that's it. All oh, right, thank you so much, Hannah. That was really excellent. It was lovely to hear that. All right, so our next reader is Rocco De Giacomo. And he lives in Toronto with his wife, Lisa Chiofila, who is a fabric artist, and his daughters, Ava and Matilda. He is a widely published poet whose work has appeared in literary journals in Canada, Australia, England, Hong Kong, and in the United States. The author of numerous poetry chapbooks and full-length collections, his latest, Casting Out by Guernica Editions, on the reconciliation of his secular lifestyle and his deeply evangelical upbringing, was published in April 2023. Welcome, Rocco. Thank you very much. I'm uh, honored and I feel very privileged to be here. Um, 
I grew up in um, a family. I wouldn't say a family. It was I grew up with a with a mother who believed that at any time, any place, you can vanish into thin air as you are taken up to heaven in what they call the rapture. It's where some of the some of humanity, the chosen, are taken up to safety while the remainder on earth um, are to live out the trials and tribulations when the antichrist or the devil takes over the earth. Um, and this rapture I, uh, was to happen in our lifetime. And my mother believed it. All of the children believed it. My father, not so much. Um, and so I'm just going to um, kind of read from this collection. It's, it's very, fairly autobiographical. It's a confessional collection. Um, and just give you a kind of um, excerpt from my life growing up in, in this. So the first poem in the collection is called For Then Shall Be Great Tribulation. Bank cards are the beginning, mom says. The Antichrist will make sure you can't buy food without his number tattooed on your arm. Grandma sits beside me in the back seat, says 666, as if completing one of her crosswords. Dad pumps the gallons, dwelling not on the opening of the seals of judgment, nor on the sun turning black as sackcloth, but the development of prime real estate outside of Wakefield, Rhode Island. They are already turning against Israel, mom says. Whatever you do, you must never, never side against Zion. Won't matter anyways, grandma says. We're all going to be taken up. Except your father, giggles mom. As he climbs up into the van, he doesn't respond, although he can guess. And this has been a nine-hour drive already. God damn it, the end times out of Sunoco and Chitawaga. Is she going to talk about this all day? For Christ's sake, Harriet, would you stop? He'll eventually say loudly, and maybe she'll stop. Or she'll take a long sip of her Pepsi through the straw, peer down the remainder of the I-95 and decide the rapture could happen over the peace bridge. And then poor Vito, suddenly alone in all that quiet. <laughs> Um, believing in this, um, I always now think back of it as um, kind of a, a morbid cosplay or cosplay, um, or think of it more as playing a game of Dungeons and Dragons, except at the end of the night when you're putting away your set, you continue to play that role as the, the, as the knight or the healer, and you live that role in your day-to-day -day life. And one of the things playing that role is you're always under attack. You're under attack every day from demons uh, and anything can be evidence of this attack, even wind, um, not human wind, but I'm talking just having a, a windy day. Um, and this is called windstorm. In the panic grass, we hold hands and pray Grandma is in the hospital again, and Mom shouts Jesus' name from the edge of the old foundation wall. Dad says we could lose the goddamn farm this time. I cast you out, Mom yells in the tumult. And in chorus, we lean, lean in and repeat after her. The oldest hollers and whoops for the Son of God as the long and green Blades are blown flat around us. In Jesus' name, Mom says, I invoke a circle of protection around this farm and this family. Weeks later, Grandma is home. The farm is still ours, and we are radiant over our fried egg sandwiches, recollecting how the wind died suddenly and how we could feel Satan vacate. Dad is out at the baker's dozen across from the farmer's depot. He's buying more bags of day-olds to stave off the money collectors. And how did my mom um, come into this? Uh, she became 
Um, she was, an, I guess, an Anglican. Uh, she was from England. Um, and I think that in the 1980s, and someone, a comedian last night I heard said, there's, there are no parents more Christian than 80s Christian parents. <laughs> um, and I think this had a lot to do with the evangelical movement of capitalizing on broadband television. Um, and this was kind of like that first barrage. Um, and um, I'm just going to talk a bit about, about my mother's beginning. This is called Touched. My mother received the Holy Spirit in a tiny uptown office crowded with worshipers and gray folding chairs and men who looked like retired beat cops ready to catch her as she tipped back as if having stood too clo close to the eastbound train roaring in. Oh, such power and enormity to be kept in a purse when you're certain that all the empty parking spots are just for you. Years later in the vineyard, they work on me in teams, meaty hands on my shoulders and neck, lips at my ear, thanking and praising as I too thank and praise and beg for lightning. Oh, you received it, mom says in the car hours later. I saw you. You received it all right. I say nothing. I look at, at the night sky. It's innumerable suns. Tonight, I will go home, terrified of the devil, his Nosferatu hands reaching from under my bed. Um, how much time, how much time do I have? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I get a little lost. Emily, I'm sorry, that's kind of exciting. Um, I'm gonna like, one more minute. One more minute, okay. Um, I will I will finish with um, 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 kind of a like you know it, it, the, the collection itself um, is about my kind of living through this and coming out of it as uh, I like to say when I'm non-confrontational a humanist when I'm feeling confrontational an atheist um, and it you know it's also a reconciliation about how I bring up my or you know how I, I raise my kids and um, this is called uh, billions and billions and it's a quote from Carl Sagan uh, it's kind of like what anybody anytime anybody wants to uh, impersonate Carl Sagan they kind of always mention billions and billions um, and um, I'll just start it she tells me vampires and ghosts aren't real life when I ask her why she wants to watch me play a zombie video game, why she isn't scared, she says, zombies are only in movies. She doesn't know about the idea of a soul or the horned monster that wants to take it to his house of fire under the ground. But thanks to a free Baptist day camp, she knows that Jesus and about Jesus and now refers to the time before she was born as when I was in the sky, which isn't entirely untrue. She thought for a while that graveyard angels were fairies and is wholly unaware of their demonic counterparts, which lie in wait to possess her body and take again her soul again to the house of fire under the ground. She goes to sleep with a turtle shell nightlight casting stars on the ceiling. And occasionally I remind her that many stars are suns that are very, very far away. And she says nothing to that, already drifting off, her body an ellipsis on a fresh page, each point, each bit of her a moat of dust from a vanished star. My daughter goes to sleep unlike me, with the door closed. Thank you, everybody. Um, our books are available. Um, I can take cash or I also take e-transfer. Thank you very much. I love that. I am also a parent. My child is kind of in between the ages of Rocco's and Jennifer's. So um, he would not come to something like this, though. 
unless we were playing like, I don't know, Minecraft YouTube videos in the background. That's what he would like to do. Um, so yes, Rocco has books for sale. Uh, and I think Cleo has books for sale, who I'm announcing next, yep. Yeah. And uh, Margaret, who will go last, also has books for sale. Um, Jennifer, do you have books for sale here? Okay, yeah, there is a book here for sale for Jennifer as well. So please, oh, Charlie's holding it up and waving it. So yeah, please support these writers by buying their books if you can. So uh, next up, we have Cleopatra Peterson. Uh, a black non-binary trans multidisciplinary artist that writes, print makes, illustrates, and more. They graduated from Toronto Metropolitan University's Fashion Communication Program and are the medal winner for cross-disciplinary arts publications at OCAD. Their work focuses on themes of nature, humor, identity, and above all, love. <laughs> Their chapbook, what we call home, was shortlisted for the BP Nicole Chapbook Award. Woo! Give it up for Cleo! Yes, I do have my books on me. Uh, I also take passion e transcript. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with it's like a short story poem. It's very short. Uh, and I've been told it's done. So I'm going to take my time and <laughs> let's see how this gets. This is called Mango Maker. People always ask me how we got here, and I always tell them it started with a mango. I'm sure somewhere someone has said that isn't how it starts. They're right. It took all kinds of fruit to get here. But for me, it started with the mango. We all love a good mango. They're a versatile fruit, after all. Salad and juice, cook it with your chicken, mix it with some tea, eat it just as it is. See, my daddy taught me how to eat a mango with my teeth. There are no knives for cutting, nothing fancy. Just me and my mouth, the hunger, and the sweet juice of it over our kitchen sink. I couldn't speak to my daddy anymore, but that doesn't mean he stopped talking to me. I hear him every time I dig my teeth into that skin and strip it back. Strings of ripe flesh stuck against my gums and threaded between my incisors. Teeth are the communion. I hear my daddy speak to me, his mother and father. Abuelitas and abuelos so old it takes three more, three or more digits to count their age. I hear them calling real close to my ear. They tell me how to find my way forward. They tell me how to make the world new again. See, every mango is an instruction on how to get it right and what can happen when it goes wrong. Have you ever had a bad mango? That's a betrayal no one wants. So I listen and I take notes because me and a mango, that's the only way I've ever heard my ancestors speak to me. I was so far from home for so long. I lost a language and unlearned the land. This was the only way I could get it back. I tell you, it took a lot of mangoes to get this right. My family was pretty patient with me until my daddy finally told me, consume the pit. Seems like a fool's errand to me, but who am I to ignore my daddy? When I try to bite it, Teeth scraping, my abuelas laugh like little bells. Whisper, no me hija, you must swallow it whole. <laughs> you don't swallow? Oh my God. <laughs> I had one break. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> now, that's a problem I'm not sure I can solve, but my tios say they know the trick. They make me laugh so hard that the mango seed just slides straight down my throat, deep into my belly. I feel the ghost of a hand pat my back, softness over spine. It takes time, all things worthwhile do. The connection builds inside of me, the magic of it, until it bubbles up past my lips and out into the world. Little phrases slip out of me, the warm comfort from my mother tongue I thought I'd never wield. I only knew the common words and curses. My R's too heavy and unrolled, awkward in my mouth. This didn't feel awkward. 
My tongue doesn't tremble over letters anymore. Now it traces out a story with ease. No, a history. Or no, no, it is memory. Memory deep from the rivers of my own veins. This, this is a birth. Only possible through their mouths and hands that had done the same as me. Over sink, sweet toothed, messy. We are connected and always have been. That's what they have been trying to teach me, that I don't have to go back, only forward. I just have to listen to the land woven into my body and the tongue of all of our mothers combined. It is the mango that captured the sweetness of our lives and passed it down to us. Juice spilled over our lips and hands. Now I hear my ancestors everywhere, but I still like to listen to the mango best. Now let's get silly. <laughs> so I'm gonna be reading from a zine I made. Um, it's called The Love of My Life Doesn't Use Dating Apps. <laughs> but maybe they'll read the zine. But all my friends bought the zine. <laughs> None of my friends are dating me. <laughs> so maybe they'll fall in love with me at this reading, who knows? <laughs> I am no longer evil, I want to be loved. <laughs> yeah. JK is still evil. <laughs> Age, heart of the cards, rage and libido of a 14 year old, body of a Silent Hill monster, mind of an only child. Insane. <laughs> Sex, yes. Gender, non binary, but not in a white way. <laughs> <laughs> Education, I went to art school twice. I have no money. <laughs> Astrology. Last time I read this, people made like gasping sounds, <gasps> which like skill issue. <laughs> Libra Sun, Leo Moon, Gemini Rising, Leo Venus, and a Libra Mars. There is barely any water in my chart. Okay, no gas. Okay. <laughs> Fun facts about me. I'm a flat earther, so it's easier to run up hills and make deals with God. <laughs> I've cracked my head open three times. And I'm so, so normal. Here we go. This is my do not interact. <laughs> DNI, if you like Harry Potter, Marvel movies, aren't crazy, don't like bears, play golf, fall asleep immediately, had scurvy, are dehydrated, won't die in my arms, don't eat pussy, good at math, haven't hyperfixated on something for over three months, won't tell me I'm beautiful with a knife to your throat, have bad, bad taste, and not good, bad taste. <laughs> you remember your childhood? You won't finance my stuffed bear hobby, and you don't believe in love. <laughs> Looking for someone to poison my omelet and tell me to settle down. Looking for someone to make me worse. Looking for stupid for stupid. <laughs> Looking for the butter to my hot knife. Looking for someone to crawl inside and build a little house behind my ribs. Please get in touch via carrier pigeon to discuss any romantic endeavors you wish to pursue with my person or via telepathy. XOXO, gossip them. I lost the phone, but I got it. So this is called trans prayer. <laughs> Built this body with your own hands Nothing could be more tender, love, and care. Now weave and sculpt a place to hold this body used to hard work. God created in his, her, their image. So God has always been trans. So you must have always been God. Uh, and now I will read uh, three poems from my, uh, oh, well, uh, shortlisted 
<laughs> not award-winning, but shortlisted uh, chapbook with my best friend Terrence, who is the beautiful boy wearing a mushroom shirt over there. Yes, everybody, clap for Terrence. We love him. Um, there are literally only three copies of this left for sale, so you better get them. <laughs> Cracks are forming, started small, mistook it for a floater. The more we settled, the more we accumulated. The larger it grew, pronounced itself an ink-drawn lightning bolt. When I was little, I would look at the ceiling flat on my back, pretending it was sky interrupted. The walls are always getting in the way. My walls are getting in the way. But look at your persistence, a hammer, pocket full of seeds, wire for a chicken coop, pail of Earl Grey paint, cedar planks and bookshelves. We hang prints on these walls, photos of family. All this reinforces the word home. Something in me crumbles. Renovating place is practice for the body. Inject myself bi-weekly, let my hair grow wild, press my torso flat, look in a mirror for once. The more we built, the easier it was to live in this house, in this body. Close my eyes to better listen to the sounds. Yours, the house, and the cats. I can tell the difference between a cat and you on the floorboards. Pitter patter versus stomp. Cicado of slow pacing. The front door's creak is different from the bathrooms. I can tell the difference between the shower and the rain. Flush of the toilet, electric buzz of your toothbrush, chime of a toaster's job well done, scrape of your fork on a plate, Bowl hitting ground, meow. Fridge ajar, my fault. Sink splash, broom across floor, spritz of bottle. If there is enough, dust absorbs sound. Claws where they shouldn't be, bed sighing under your weight, the shifting of sheets, stillness before a jump, motor purr, hand against fur, your breeze breath, heartbeat drum. Hand against flesh, a soft question open my eyes to answer. <laughs> How do you learn to cook out of love? Here in our kitchen, the oven is warm, cats at our feet. The fridge sings to us, the kettle chorus. I want to nourish you with more than this body can offer, give you something you can sink your teeth into, chew, swallow, savor want to render you delighted, three course meal each season to keep you here with me. You love eggs, I make eggs. You love carrot cake, I make carrot cake. I burn it all, you eat it all. Like most things, it is all learned through practice. This is the last poem, thank you. <laughs> Do all ghosts live in attics? I imagine them floating up from baseboards to crawl around the rafters. We find a shoebox. I imagine our cat that is now a flower bed. The side is sunken. It has stood in the way of our current problem, a leak drip dropping down onto our bed. I am scared to open it, but you have brave hands. Where I imagine wisps of ectoplasm and a scream, there is just a lifted lid of dust, the sound of settling. The box holds letters, photographs, postcards, other ghosts. Here are people just like us. I bend with the weight of knowing we have always lived here. No matter a time, no matter what we were told, we existed, laughed, held cameras, loved, dark skinned and shape shifted one or another or both. Once upon a time, there lived a couple in a house. They scattered their matter in every room, carved their heights into door frames and scratched the floors when they danced. They built a home. We were living under the foundation of those before us, this skeletal structure, this house, our bodies. We are building something new from what we were given, something bigger, something ours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cleopatra. That was beautiful. 
All right, we have our final reader next. This is Margaret Novacek, and they are a clinical geneticist and a writer. She is also a professor of pathology and molecular medicine and pediatrics at McMaster University. Her writing has appeared in numerous Canadian and American literary magazines, and her memoir, Chasing Zebras, was published by Woolsack and Wynn in 2021 and won the 2022 Sardin Award for Memoir. Her as yet untitled collection of essays is forthcoming in spring 2024, and she lives in Hamilton with her husband, a foundling cat, and a rescue greyhound, her two sons having flown the coop. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dorian, for inviting me. And thank you, Brock's Inviter Series, for having me here today. Um, I'm going to uh, read the introduction to my memoir, Chasing Zebra, Z, which I brought a few copies of, if anybody's interested. And also, there are some cards if you want to order it from my publisher. So this is the introduction, uh, which explains why I wrote the whole book. And it starts with an epigraph from Henry Miller. <clears throat> what one has to tell is not nearly so important as the telling itself. Beginning. Who wants to read first? Rita Sharon asks our group. A professor of internal medicine and a Henry James scholar, for years she was known at the Columbia Medical School as the crazy book lady who told anybody who would listen about how reading literature enhanced the practice of medicine. I have to read. I just have to. I did not travel all the way to New York City to sit this one out. This story has been eating at me for almost 10 years. I remember the response from a female classmate three years ago when I read what I had written in my first creative writing class. I hate this. I hate you for making me hear this. I so hope it will be different here. These are doctors, nurses, social workers who came from around the world to learn how to improve, improve clinical medicine. An inner city hospital chaplain sits directly across the table from me. They all have witnessed the enduring misery of the human condition in patients and in doctors. And I want somebody, anybody, to see what my job is about, to see me. I'm attending a narrative medicine workshop at Columbia University Vagalus College of Physicians and Surgeons. In my workshop group, I ate healthcare professionals huddled around tables arranged in a circle in a classroom on a glorious October Saturday in New York City. Outside, the leaves on the Linden's lining Broadway are beginning to change and the afternoon sun angles through the tall windows. Narrative medicine, a revolutionary approach to medical care centers on the patient's story as opposed to their condition and was conceived and developed at Columbia by Rita. She has advocated for the study of narrative texts, both literary and spoken, to refine medical history taking. In addition to the close reading of literature texts to improve a physician's grasp of patient's story, she also uses writing prompts, reflective writing, and sharing one's writing with others to support physicians in identifying factors that might be affecting their patient-doctor interaction. As well, these techniques can help physicians process their own emotions. Because as long as a story is not told and, un and unheard, it festers. I'm about to realize how much. Me, I almost shoot my head, hand up as I used to in school. It's been a decade and I've never told anybody how I felt. I am hurt, I am upset. I have to share, I must. I just need to, have to go first. My heart pounds so much. It hurts. Yes, I know heartbeat doesn't hurt. What I feel is the increased heart rate and the adrenaline flooding my arteries and veins, the anxiety of unmasking myself and the fear of judgment and rejection on moral grounds. I don't care what the physiological explanation is. My heartbeat hurts. I read. When I finish, my cheeks and neck are burning but already there seems to be more space in my rib cage and that stiff membrane that constricted my heart. I glance around. I met these people only the night before. 
when we shared an innocent icebreaker of a writing prompt. Tell me the story of your name. What do they think of me now? What I have just read is not the same as I changed my name from Algajata when a teacher butchered it one time too many. They laughed, they had laughed at that. Now, silence pounds in my ears. Are they repulsed by my true colors? Too shocked to even say anything? Are they angry? But the faces are not turning away in disgust or recoiling in horror. Nadia across the table smiles a kind smile that lights up her face and nods at me. What did you hear? Rita asks. How much she's hurting, Thomas says. How it's eating away at her. It's so dark though, Nadia says. How can she make it better for herself? Rita asks after a pause, during which all I hear is my pounding heartbeat. She can't change the memory, Chris Ann says, but she can change how she looks at it. What if Rita stops? Things. The name, Savannah. Is that her real name? Yes, I say. Well, how about instead of thinking of her being trapped in her body, you play with the image of her name? Big spaces, the openness of the African Savannah, free, boundless. She peers at me sideways, head tilted like a curious bird. Hmm? I nod, even though I'm not convinced that this mind trick will change anything. I have always thought of Savannah as a ruined medieval castle, but something has already shifted inside me. Rita knows what she's talking about. It feels so, so great to have read it, I blurt out. My voice is shaking. It makes such a difference that you all listen. Rita watches me seriously, waits. See, she says finally, her warm gray eyes on me. You made room for more. So that's the introduction to my memoir. And now for something completely different. <laughs> <laughs> this is a little nothing that I wrote um, a few years ago and it's titled Greek Drama. Kara wanted Philip to want her, not to sleep with, of course not, she was happily married, just to obsess about her, find her attractive. They agreed on so many things. David Foster Wallace, freakishly brilliant. <laughs> Yoga, indispensable. Goldfish, pretty. Cognitive behavioral therapy, a complete waste of time. <laughs> yes, she was older than him. Yes, she had let her hair grow out gray, but she did get a funky haircut. She still looked great when dressed, her small breasts not yet saggy. And even though in profile her hair stuck out, it disappeared when she stood on tiptoes. Nine years difference was an, an insurmountable abyss. Her personality and accomplishments should overcome that. And then some. Fantasizing about him made Kara feel young and sexy. From behind her oversized prescription sunglasses, beneath her wide brimmed hat, Kara ogled Philip as he sauntered through the waves towards the beach. Discreetly, of course. <laughs> One could bounce a quarter off his belly, even if you could drive a truck between his bowed legs. <laughs> Unlike Philip's wife, Kara kept on trying, Pilates, jogging, online courses. She is given up ages ago, Philip had told Kara the year before. He would appreciate all of Kara's efforts. She had organized their sailing trip to the Aegean, paid for it, a gift for herself on her 50th birthday, a romp with her imaginary boy toy in the Greek Isles, and for appearances sake, the boy toy's wife to whom he wasn't speaking. Maybe the timeless hedonistic Aegean son would help Philip declare himself, Kara hoped. Sorry if I'm spoiling things, Philip's wife texted Kara from the shore in Hydra on the fourth day. She had left the boat in the half that morning. Can't fake it anymore, my marriage is ending. 
always making them all about herself, Kara shrugged. She had no time for histrionics. What if I fell in love with somebody, Philip had asked Kara the night before as they walked the pebbly beach, the inky sea shimmering under the waxing moon. Her belly tensed, her heart drum. Oh yeah. <laughs> Do you have somebody in mind? She asked all innocent. Hypothetical question. Shit. <laughs> you could always fall in love with me, Kara said and flinging her arms wide open, tripped on a stone and tumbled down in a heap at his feet. He pulled her up, his face impassive. Not a word more as they walked back to the boat. Kara couldn't stop thinking about his penis she had glimpsed dangling oh so low in his swimming trunks the day before. <laughs> Comical, her husband said when Kara shared her fantasies when they returned home. You're just too old. She asked him for a divorce three days later. <laughs> Thank you. Get that divorce, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Um, so, oh, actually, this is in the script for you. So, uh, it's a little piece. So, thank you for providing your questions and comments. If you have a question in YouTube, like really, please type it in fast. We're going to get the um, readers, all the authors uh, up here to answer questions, and we can just adjust things a little bit so you'll see. Okay, so thank you so much for being here. So now is the time for audience questions. Uh, Jen, is there any from YouTube? No. Okay. <laughs> any from the audience here? Uh, okay. Uh, into, the, into the microphone, please. So my my dad was Dominican, uh, oh, okay. but did not speak Spanish. Oh, okay. So that kind of was kind of the basis for that story as well. Oh, I guess kind of thank you. Yeah, because yeah, I don't know any Spanish in that. So that's <laughs> <laughs> Questions from the audience? Yes. I really enjoyed all the readings. Um, what are you working on next or now? Or what do you dream of working on next? So, where I had a view is um, usually when I get the idea to write, it's like seconds before I fall asleep. So for years, <laughs> I was like, fuck it, I'm gonna remember tomorrow morning. <laughs> so I'm just trying to um, retain more of those, those thoughts and start writing some of those uh, essays for those pieces that I'm looking forward to working on. <laughs> um, I have a novel, I guess. Uh, it's a TCC werewolf novel. Um, and I'm on my second. Draft of revisions on that, and then maybe one day it will be published by Tor. Dream big. Manifesting the secret. It's working, but it's very low. It's very quiet. Can you turn that down? I don't know if I can get flashed. Maybe it's a little level. Set or natural. Yeah. 
It said on natural. That's what it is. There, oh, no, I don't know. I'm just making that up. It's like, like, oh, oh, it says natural. That one did seem to work. Testing. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm I'm working on uh, two manuscripts. One is connecting um, the biological with the astronomical, um, and the second is kind of looking at the 1980s um, uh, through the scope of uh, phobias, um, and I think it's something to do with having to grow up, having grown up in the 1980s and. Um, or come of age in the 1980s and all that entails. 1980s were cool. <laughs> I was a psycho. <laughs> I wasn't even a psycho. I was 19. <laughs> I am not working on anything right now. I finished the essays that's coming out, they're coming out next year, and I finished a novel that nobody wants to publish. <laughs> And uh, just struggling right now, but that's that's about it. But uh, the essays are coming up from uh, my my publisher, Will Will Second, in uh, next spring. Oh, wow. that's good. Jen was doing the talk and she was like, you got to embody it. You got to listen to the shower. And you got... So I did, uh, after I put everything together, I read it through once because Dorian said it had to be 11 minutes. And I was like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I only got four minutes. <laughs> but as a newbie, I was like, it's, it's better when you're not really sure how it's going to be perceived or received, that it's, it runs short rather than long. And even when I did the couple of read-throughs, because I only did that twice before I came up here, um, I just, once I get it out, it's out. It's, it's done. And if I keep reading it over and over again, uh, because I am restless, I, I, get, I just get bored of it. So I, I only read it through twice, and then I just came here and, and uh, performed it. So... I don't know if this is just a new thing for me because this is the first time I've ever done that. Um, but I feel like because I wrote these things um, in the last like maybe five years, like just here, 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 it all kind of had a theme. And that's where I got my confidence from was because this is coming out in my paintings and this is coming out in these little blurbs that I'm writing, then that's my theme. And that's kind of where I got the confidence to get up and say it because I, I felt it was aligned somehow uh, with the greater flow of things. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, the question is for all of you. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. uh, I think when you get to read something you've like written, it just, you make it come alive in a different way. Like words on a page are a bit different than when you're being able to vocalize it. I think it goes into what was being said about like pausing and intonation and how you're saying things. Also, like it, when I read like the dating scene, it feels like I'm doing comedy, <laughs> which is like kind of wild. <laughs> I'm being so honest about what I want in a relationship. Um, but yeah, I just think it makes it a bit different. And I kind of, it was the same. Like I, I was like, oh shit, I need to have 11 minutes. <laughs> so I did read it. I timed myself to see where it goes. And I like, I got like 11 minutes in the first one. And the more that I like did it, 
I got to like 1026. So I was like, okay, we're good. <laughs> we got this. If I mess up at all, then, you know, I have that 30 second, <laughs> 30 seconds of buffer, but yeah. Um, I think so. I, I agree that they're kind of two different things the to to read to an audience or to recite or perform for an audience and to have something on the page where someone's going to read it quietly to themselves. Um, actually, as I was reading, I, I, I noticed myself, I don't know if you've noticed, but I had little hiccups where where it had been changed because you know through the editing process the editor decided to go with something different that would be more visually digestible on the page and work a little better with the with the line breaks and the little tricks on the page and it kind of threw me um, um a little bit while i was reading this out loud um and i and i think that um you know reading to yourself quietly um it's a lot different from list, obviously listening, and um, I think that uh, I think that you there are two different things, um, and it it can be tricky trying to read something from um, out loud or perform something that's been edited for 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 the page. I was I've been trying to figure out what the question had been from their answers. Yeah. Just um, my thing was uh, when you write um, and when you have this thing that's written words on a page, how does it change for you when you perform it, or like do you get something different out of it? Does it become a different thing? I see. So one thing that I notice is that um, as I'm reading this, uh, it could have been edited some more. <laughs> It could sound better and be, be more buffy and, 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 and more to the point. Uh, and, but that's how I feel about all of my writing. So no change here. Um, so, and I could keep on editing my writing till kingdom come and not be happy with it. So there, there's a point where I have to give it to somebody and be done with it. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can I hear? Yeah. Okay. Did Tana did something to the board, so I thought. Hi. Uh, great readings. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. Now, it seems to me, uh, and this may be reading a little bit with with some of you, but it seemed to me that behind, also, I mean, Rocco was very eloquent and explicit about, about it in some ways, but it seems to me that there's, uh, you know, personal transformation seems to be lurking either explicitly or implicitly in a lot of what was read. And I'm just wondering, as writers, when you write back, and, you know, obviously, even in stuff that is somewhat autobiographical or, you know, there's still fiction involved, right? We are, we're not, you know, we're shaping, we're forming, we're making stuff up. That may be true, but we're still making stuff up. Maybe truer than the things that were actually, you know, specifically the way they were. How does it feel when you hear yourself or read yourself? Um, do you feel like you're, are you still you? Um, <laughs> it's interesting that you say that because um, there's some things that I write and then when I go over them maybe a month or two later, I'm like, who the fuck wrote that? <laughs> like it just didn't, it just shifts from moment to moment. So if I don't capture it, I'm somebody else in another moment and looking back and saying, oh my goodness, I guess, I guess that's what you said. So it, it seems to for me personally, I, I write something that I've left that moment and then it's on to something else unless that particular feeling comes back to me. And then that's usually when I pay attention. When I start to see myself writing things over and over again, over a span of time, then I think to myself in my equation, this must be true. There must be something there or else, because other times I just write something and it's just a reflection of what I'm thinking that day and it doesn't really ring true. Um, so for me, it's just trying to read back and see, because some of the pieces I wrote when I, the unfounded one, for example, when I, when I read that again, it was a note from my Samsung notes from four years ago. 
And I was like, who wrote this? And then when I started to think about it, I thought, okay, no, I think I'm still there. And so that's why um, I included it. But it's it's tricky. It's tricky because I'm I'm trying to find the truth of things. And that's why I think that there's a lot of perspectives. And I'm I'm thinking always, well, perspectives change. And so those sometimes truth can't be found there. But if it starts to reoccur, then that's my key. And that's kind of what I'm trying to get to. I guess I think of writing as like an exploration in a way. Um, I feel, I always feel like a fraud as a writer because like, I, I don't know, I didn't come to, it wasn't something that I like grew up wanting to be. Like I read books, I sell books, I do all of those things that I do. Like writing, it's just kind of different process practice for my brain. It reminds me of good old Ann Carson being like, where am I supposed to put it down? And like you put it down by like writing it and creating things and putting it out. And I feel like we're always growing and we're always learning, we're always changing. And then that just reflects in the, the work that you're making. It has to, because if you just keep sticking on the same thing, like you're gonna get bored of yourself, people are gonna get bored of you. You just have to like continue to grow as a person and as an artist and creator. Um, so yeah, I guess it's a way to put it down. I'm always changing, I'm always growing and that's what it is to be human, I guess. That's a that's a that's a that's a very good question. Um, I think I could look at it in, in, in a couple of ways. Um, when I think back on my earlier works, I think that um, if they're confessional, um, if they're like about something that happened, I I I would say that I'm still me, but it's maybe a a, a me that I've I've um, that that uh, that maybe could have used some editing. Like, um, and, but then again, this, that, but that, you know, when we look at other ways of writing, say, for example, um, when you become little, when you take the more objective side, like, and you're not writing about yourself, um, you might be writing about a historical figure or um, is, you know, is, does that question still apply? Um, and because I am now moving away from the confessional into other uh, other topics, and are these pieces that are non-confessional still me? Um, I'm, and, and that's why your questions kind of stumped me. Um, I I would say that um, we're in a way we're all kind of if we're writing in the confessional, then we're kind of all prisoner. Not wouldn't say prisoners, but we're all kind of we are we can't escape our past. And so um, I'm going to say that, yeah, regardless of what I, what I write in the confessional um, or in an autobiographical sense, I'm, it's always me. Um. Um, I wrote a memoir, so it's all... <laughs> <laughs> there, it took a good five, six years to write it and a few things have changed in my perception of the world and my perception of myself as I was writing. So that was, but it was still me. When I write fiction, like the second part piece that I read today, um, that's not me. Uh, I tried to make it up, although there are bits and pieces from life that inspire, that inspire fiction, but uh, fiction's fiction. So that's, that's probably my answer. Question? Um, I forgot that was yeah. our question. Um, so, yeah. Um, hi. So, yeah, thank you so much for being here. And it was really interesting to hear um, all of your thoughts on, on like how you were writing and stuff like that. And on that sort of similar topic, I kind of wanted to ask about uh, inspiration uh, and where do you see yourself getting sort of inspired by uh, support? inspired to kind of create like your uh, authentic or unique writing styles, uh, if it's other writers, other media, or things that happen in your life, like where do you pull inspiration? Where do you like to pull inspiration? Um, I guess because I, I um, like this is the first time I've ever written something that got on the internet. Uh, <laughs> 
but for me, I, I spend a lot of time trying to understand things, trying to understand myself. And I think somewhere on the back burners, there's something being woven. And I, and I don't know, maybe that's why it haunts me right before I go to sleep. But after, like, this is the stuff that I wrote today, it's been like in the last 10 years. But these are things that I've been thinking about as a kid, things that I was curious about. I was always really observant about what was going on and reading people and, and trying to read myself. And um, my best guess right now is that it, it, has, it has come from all that back burning boiling content and and it, I think it just started to spill over and which is why it came to me in like full sentences right before I was going to go to bed <laughs> so I think that's I think that's where mine mine comes from I guess I could break it down into a couple of parts there's the trauma which is generational and parental etc 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 uh there are my hot friends who are over there who I love and are all very talented and like getting to read their writing and have their work and just like a community of other artists like they inspire me like getting to collaborate and see other people's work like really informs my practice and just like the world kind of whether that is the world being horrible like any, like for like the trans prayer, for example, is just kind of like, how can I make something good that trans people can have to kind of just know that like, there is like, because trans people are good and they deserve that goodness yet we live in a world where it's like, so designed to like kill them, which is horrible. So it's just a poem, but it's like a small way to combat that. So. I guess sometimes like things like that, like those horrible things will get stuck in my head and I'm like, and through writing or creating like a print or something like that's how I work through it. And that's how I like kind of just be like, this is my small piece against the horrors of the world, I guess. Yeah. Kind of resistance poetry. Um, I, I think for myself, um, I, I've noticed that through my collections, there's always a conflict. There's always two op um, opposing themes. So for example, travel, domestication. Um, my, this one is about my, um, the, you know, my, eighth, my present atheism with my past, with my past uh, evangelicalism. Um, the next one is about the astro astronomical and the biological and then you know the next one's about kind of me confronting in my life during the 1980s i think that um for me there's always this tension and it's always kind of like this whatever this idea is for a manuscript it kind of like just builds in the back of my head uh until it kind of gestates i guess in a way um and it you know and then it just comes out um I'm a bit of a gatherer, so I pick and choose all sorts of different things, but um, for other art forms, I would say it's poetry and, and painting, uh, especially sort of colorful, lively paintings like Henri Matisse or Georgia O'Keeffe or anything that just kind of stirs you up. Um, my work and uh, fears and issues are sort of, uh, arising from that. And science that's about it and then about life i mean it's hard to pick one particular thing that inspires me but those would be the main ones i'm just going to add also that um um you know this is this this word kind of has a as a, leaves a bad taste in everybody's mouth, but the internet, the internet is um, it's like fire. It's an amazing tool. There's things that I would never been able to write uh, without having access to almost all the information in the world, um, instant access to this. Um, and so I think that I was, you know, listening to, there's an internet series where a guy talks to an older, like a 40 something man talks to his teenage daughter and he's trying to talk about like, um, um, uh, what do you call it? encyclopedias? And he explains to her that these were the internet in book form. Um, and he would, and she, and you know, for someone who's grown up with the internet where you can get something immediately, this idea of having to go to a book 
and find something and take that energy to do that is 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 it's 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 almost inconceivable for them. But it's it, you know the internet is an amazing tool. It gets you know it can it it does it harms as as much as it helps. But it's 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 you know there's this endless information there. I think yeah the internet, but for me like I think memes because like I do try to put. <laughs> I do try to put humor into, especially the heavy stuff. Um, like I do, I like dating scene that's kind of whatever, I'm single or whatever. Um, but like, especially when I'm dealing with heavy stuff, especially in like my print making art practice, like I try to put humor into it. And like the internet, as much as there are the horrors, there's also the humor and the stuff that makes me laugh. And like my whole purpose is to send a funny picture to my friend group kind of thing. like. I like love being able to do that. Uh, so that really informs kind of my work as well. Do <laughs> <laughs> you have any other questions? I think I think we have time for me to ask a very silly question if nobody else does. Any other questions that are not silly? <laughs> okay. 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 So I just only I, silly questions from here. On. Only silly <laughs> questions. So this is kind of inspired by like, there's no water in your signs, right? And like, no, religion is pretty bad, right? Rocco and like, Margaret, science is good. And I'm like, where does like the supernatural and the spiritual and the woo woo stuff play a part? Because like. I'm very like, um, I, you know, skeptic. There's no God, but like sometimes I feel a little woo about writing, and like I'm just wondering if you have feelings about that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> um, I'm not religious at all. Like I didn't grow up with religion or anything, um, but I think for me, like I can find God in anything. Uh, like God is what I make it like god is the friends that i love over there like that is that for me um and i think that it's i do mention god a lot in some of my like writing but like i have no like skin in the game and also <laughs> i love how horny catholicism is like <laughs> i love it <laughs> like i think it's so fun um and oh thank you oopsies that was god um, <laughs> But yeah, I think it, I think like not having any Catholic guilt and being able to like be horny about stigmata and stuff like <laughs> I'm living. Um, yeah, uh, I forget the question, but that's my answer to spirituality. <laughs> God is what you make it. Um, I think it. I think that um, I you know I I I. It's weird. I'm an atheist, but however, I always capitalize the G when I write God. Just in, you know, it's and I always knock. On, I always knock on wood. Uh, I always I, and it drives me nuts. I, I teach adults, and it drives me nuts when someone walks in with an open umbrella. I'm kind of watching it at the back of the room, um, and so these all these. It's interesting. These all these things that come as like a reflex um, that I can't control. Um, I also like have the most, uh, you know, in, I, I, you know, um, as I as mentioned in my poem, I, I go to bed with the door open, um, usually a light on, my daughter completely black in the room, door closed, um, and I have a bru. I had this going to recover from a bruise here because of my, the, the amount of nightmares I have, um, and, you know, uh, what we call um, the old hag that stands in your room when you have sleep paralysis, and so, uh, you know, uh, for me, everything uh, in my waking life is is kind of like atheistic. However, all of these reflexes and when I'm not watching or when I'm not controlling it come out in this oddly, I'm going to say, um, like sp spiritual way. And it informs your writing because I am asking about writing, not just about it. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Um, I, I, I would say yeah, but I'm going to pass it off. I'm not so much of this. Go ahead. 
So I, I had three thoughts, but now I can only remember two. So I'll tell you the two. So uh, number one, woo-woo definitely happens. Magic happens when your story aligns and starts making sense. And there are bits in it that you had no idea you knew. Yeah. And then you look it up and you say, oh, oh, oh. I picked St. Agatha as the church, but St. Agatha is a patroness for uh, women with breast cancer, and my character is dying of breast cancer. Ooh. <laughs> I had no idea that St. Agatha was a patron. patron okay. So that's the woo-woo. The woo-woo does happen. And the other one, more seriously, is I became convinced of the existence of a higher power. Call it whatever you want. It, him, her, they, them, it, whatever, call it whatever you want when I was studying embryology, learning how a human body is formed over pretty much 14 weeks from a single cell, as miraculously as it is and as it happens. There is something watching over us for that to happen as flawlessly as often as it does. And there was a third thing that was something to do with, with, with that, but I can't remember if I remember I'll grab the mic again. <laughs> um, for me, I, I think there is something there. Uh, I don't, you know, in the, in, the, in the common sense that there's something above. I think, like, I, I, feel, I feel the flow. When I, when I have my heart open and I listen to myself, um, particularly if I'm you know, out in nature, sometimes the breeze just comes and I feel like I'm part of something. I feel like I'm part of the water. I feel like I'm part of the wind. And um, to me, like I, I just call that the flow. Like there's a flow of something. And when I was putting together all these things, when, when they remembered to put me on in July and I was like, oh fuck, what do I got? And I started, <laughs> and I started um, going through all the stuff that I'd written and then I made that self portrait. I thought this all flows together. There's, there's definitely an undercurrent here. And um, that's, that's what I try to write. I try to write in a way that it makes sense to me in a broader sense. And that's what I got when I put all those things together. I felt, wow, like, I don't know if this is gonna resonate with anybody else, but that wasn't really the point. It was just the point of self-expression that was backed with what I thought was a belonging in, in between my internal and external world. Thank you so much for humoring me with that. We have one final question that will bring us to time, I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah, which is uh, we would like each of you to recommend a book, ideally a book, that you've read somewhat recently, a book that we can find in bookstores or um, libraries or on eBooks. Something you read. Oh, oh, well, I was just like, oh man, I'm gonna look up that title. There's something, but I can't remember exactly what. Um, so, oh, Brock is doing the same. Let's do the same. Um, but so we 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 like these. We gather these. We read these. Um, recommend us a book, Hannah. It looks like you're ready. Okay, so. Uh, I might, I might not know the author's name. I want to say Andrew Kaufman, but maybe not. But the book is called um, All My Friends Are Superheroes. Yeah, I don't have to look it up. That's Andrew Kaufman. Yep. Yeah. Hi, I'm just pulling up the staff picks on type books so I can remember the title, <laughs> which is where I work, by the way. Uh, so if you ever want a good recommendation for weird stuff, I'm your guy. Sorry, what books did you remember? Weird stuff. What? Right. What bookstore do you work? Oh, at? I worked at Type Books. <laughs> type Books on Queen? Uh, in the Junction, actually, which is the better location. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. okay. Um, I'm going to recommend two. I'm going to recommend a, a novella and a graphic novel. I'm sorry, this is my job, so it's hard for me to only do one. So um, I read The Salt Grows Heavy by Cassandra Ka, uh, and it's only 100 pages. Uh, it made me sit old upright in bed. It's like gory and disgusting and romantic in the best way. I loved it so much. Uh, if you like plague doctors, uh, selkies, uh, just weird, it's so good. Uh, and I'm gonna recommend, that's the book. I made I made sure Yasmin got it. My best friend Yasmin, sorry, hi Yasmin, shout out Yasmin. Um, because I was trying to live blog it to her as I was reading it. 
And the second one is a graphic novel by Silver Sprocket, and it's called Prokyrody Season. I might be pronouncing that wrong, but it's about like two horrible trans people who like have a codependent relationship. And uh, when you love someone uh, and you want them to notice you, you give them a forest sickness uh, and then you have to go cure them. It's just funny and trans and it's like so beautiful. It's perfect. Those are my two favorite books of 2023. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't know we'd have an expert. <laughs> I'm also going to recommend a, a novel and a poetry, book of poetry. Uh, the first is the, for the novel is A Brother uh, by, and I'm going to, Butcher the last name uh, uh, by David uh, Chariandi. Yeah, that's not right. That's not bad. Is that right? Yeah. Chariandi, beautiful. It's a gorgeous book. Um, and uh, the sorry, just speak at that. Um, oh my goodness! My big thumbs. <laughs> <laughs> This is like a Homer Simpson moment, like mash, mash. That is everybody here too young to remember the mashing? Sorry. Um, you know, uh, sorry everybody. I'm. It's a it's a book called, and again, I know this person, but the I'm sure it's Stephen or anybody can help me out here um it's a book called um as far as you know uh poetry book and i will probably grab the mic um when it comes to me the name and um but it's a really really good book and uh, i'm just going to pass it off right now so i have finished reading recently time shelter by georgi kospodinov who uh, won the International Booker in Translation. It's a Bulgarian writer, and it's got an amazing premise. It starts off with putting together these Al uh, um, Alzheimer villages. I don't know if you've heard about them, when they have a whole little village that where people with dementia, various stages of dementia live. Well, this person, uh, this one of the protagonists in there, starts off by doing these apartments uh, and that are set in the childhood or youth of a particular person suffering from dementia. So a 70s apartment in Bulgaria or a 60s apartment in Switzerland, that kind of thing. And it's, of course, a Swiss clinic. But then it spreads out to the point that whole countries vote and have referenda on which decade they want to live in. So for example, Sweden chooses the 70s. Uh, Italy chooses the 80s. Uh, I forget what Poland chose. I think it was early 90s. Uh, where they so it because that's where they felt mo most comfortable. So it's it's a really great great book. Time shelter. Time shelter. Time shelter. Yeah. A. F. Moritz. That's it. As far as you know, A. F. Moritz. Yeah. Yeah. House of Nancy Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, can I get a big hand for our amazing? So I next, uh, I guess I should walk in front of you so I can be on the camera for a closing. Can you see me? Okay, so our next Brockton Writer Series is September 13th, 2023. Mark your calendar, September 13th. We'll be back in person here at Glad Day and also live on YouTube. Um, we'll keep up the good work of pivoting to keep our like global audience. I don't know if it's actually global. We've definitely got remote audience, but I'm gonna I'm gonna assume there's people here from Switzerland in the 90s. <laughs> uh, in September, we'll hear readings from David Nichol, Hannah Mary McKinnon, Lisa Chen, and Zilla Jones. And as always, we'll bring in an industry professional to teach us something new about the craft or business of writing. Thank you, Brockton Writers. Thank you, Ontario Arts Council. Thank you, Glad Day. Thank